Now, the moon is a pretty neat thing. It, uh, you know, a lot of people see a face, the man in the moon, and some people have seen carts, some people have seen women in bonnets. It's un weird how they see all these things. But, uh, you know, the sea of tranquility, the sea of serenity, that's where Apollo 11 first landed, was right there in that chunk. And when it's in phases, it actually makes it easier for you to appreciate the contour of the moon. Because when it's full, it's bright, but it, still, you can't tell about all these little craters, all these things that have pockmarked it. And so it's really, it's best to watch it as it's going through the phases rather than when it's full. And even binoculars will show a lot of amazing features. But the moon can do a lot of other interesting things uh, for us. Certainly lunar eclipses is one thing. Now as the moon orbits around the Earth, if it moves in the Earth's shadow, it'll be a lunar eclipse. And it usually looks like this. Why is it orange? Anybody know? Why is it coppery, reddy, orangey color as opposed to just solid black? It's moving in a shadow. If you were on the moon and you were looking at Earth, when the moon was eclipsed, you're going to see a sunset around the entire planet because the sun has set behind that earth you're watching that's eclipsing you. So it's all of the sunsets more or less added up there. All of that orange diffracted light is coming through and that's why it tends to look that color. Unless there's a lot of pollution in the sky or if a, you know, a volcano like Mount Pinatubo puts a lot of stuff up in the atmosphere, then it might be just more blacky gray, but that's the nice classic kind of lunar eclipse. Likewise, a solar eclipse will be when the moon moves in front of the Earth, but un because the moon is so much smaller than the Earth, that shadow is going to be in one very specific spot and trace a very specific trail across the planet. And that's why Catherine and I have traveled to the Caribbean to see one solar eclipse and, and Turkey to see another. And those are interesting stories that I'll share with you over a glass of wine sometime. But um, it's a very specific spot. So you have to travel, whereas a lunar eclipse, as long as it's the night sky and the skies are clear, you can see it. But these are a little bit more precious. The next solar eclipse in North America is 2017, but the longest solar eclipse in our lifetime is next year, and it's going to be most easily seen in China and the Sea of Japan. So in July 2009, if you want to see a good solar eclipse that lasts maybe six minutes, then uh, that's the place to go. Now, solar eclipses, this is what you'd have to have solar filters on to be able to see it at these phases, so that you'll see just this tiny little crescent. And then the very last little bit of the sun will shine through there. And so they often call this the diamond ring because you see one bright burst of the sun. You can kind of see the corona coming around it. You can actually see even little solar flares poking out. And that's really quite something. Shouldn't still look at it with the naked eye at this point, but I'll tell you, I've been tempted, so I did kind of take quick little scans there. And then when it's total, you get this beautiful pearly corona. And it's actually hotter than the surface of the sun. It has to do with the magnetic poles of the sun itself. But it's really something to see. There's nothing like it on Earth um, otherwise because you, everywhere you look, it's like a sunset off in the distance. And when the light is just about totally gone, it's a very weird light. I always say it's like when you take the lampshade off if you're painting in your room. You know, the lampshade diffuses the light, but it comes from a very fine point if it's just a bulb, so the light is bright and weird. And it's like that. The shadows are very weird. The animals all of a sudden start to go back into the barn. It's really neat, and it should be one of the hundred things you do before you die is see a solar eclipse. If you were on the International Space Station, the solar eclipse will look like that on Earth where there's just a big black hole there where the shadow is moving across. And here's another trivia question for you because the moon orbits the sun, or sorry, orbits the Earth once a month, so every two weeks it's either in front or behind the planet Earth. Why don't we see these eclipses every month? Well, it turns out if you define the plane, let's say you have the sun and you have Earth, and that's like a record, like an LP, an old vinyl LP. And we, we call that the ecliptic in astronomy. Well, not everything is in the same plane as that ecliptic, and it turns out that the moon's orbit around Earth is tilted about five degrees, and the Earth itself is only half a degree, or sorry, the moon is only half a degree in the sky. So five degrees means there's a lot of play back and forth where the moon is either above or below the shadow of the Earth and never causes an eclipse. But turns out when it is at the right point where they're lined up correctly, 
Usually then there might be a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse just two weeks apart because they're just lined up that way. But that's why we don't see them every month because the moon's orbit isn't in the same plane as the Earth's orbit around the sun. Let's move on a bit farther then now. We'll go into the solar system. We'll, we'll explore our neighborhood a little bit farther than just our neighbor. This isn't to scale for distance, but it is to scale for size. So you can see the surface of the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, that's the largest asteroid series there. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto and its moon Charon. And then you've got this one out here, which now just still has a designated number. But at one point it was being called Xena after the warrior princess. Yeah, you know, I can understand when you look at all of these, especially that one out there, why Pluto got demoted. I don't think Pluto cares what we call it, frankly. But um, this is the size of all these. So we have these inner rocky bodies, and then we have these big outer gas giants. Well, the sun, thank goodness it's here, or we wouldn't be here. It's just a big ball of hydrogen that's turning into helium. The neat thing about, about it is it's not burning it by combustion, like, you know, the way the Hindenburg blew up. It's, it's converting it from hydrogen to helium through fusion. And so it's by, nine, by Einstein's equations, E equals mc squared, that that subtle little loss of mass is converted into energy. And that's why this thing can last for many billions of years rather than just a few million, which is how long it would take to combust the amount of hydrogen. And that's what the sun looks like if you could look at it with a hydrogen alpha filter. This is what it would look like if you looked with just standard filters. I have filters for my binoculars. They eliminate all but one thousand of one percent of the light that comes through. And I looked at the sun earlier today just to kind of report what it looks like. You can see these sunspots. Well, there are none. We're kind of at a sunspot low right now in the sun cycle. It goes through 11-year cycles. But that's, you know, it's brighter in the middle and sort of darker on the limbs. And that's exactly how it looked when I looked at it earlier today minus the sunspots. But these sunspots are quite neat. They look small if you look at the surface of the sun. But there's one compared to the diameter of Earth. So they really are pretty sizable. They also are very bright. They're just so much darker than the sun that's right next to it that that's why they look black in the pictures. They're still very bright. They're just, uh, it's just different. It has to do with a lot of the magnetic activity of the sun where lots of funny flares are coming out. These flares look like this and there can be big loops and swirls and if it's really bright, a whole bunch of solar particles will come out towards Earth, and then that's where you get these sorts of aurora that can come across to the poles. Now, there's the new moon, and there's Mercury, the closest planet to the sun. Only takes about 88 days to go around the sun, so that's why it's Mercury, because it's the, the god of speed and fleetness. How many people here have confirmed they've seen Mercury with their own eyes? Well, you know, there's not going to be many. And don't feel bad. Even Copernicus never saw Mercury. It, it's very easy to see with the naked eye. It's, it's very easy, but it's only at certain times. And it's going to always be either right at sunset or sunrise. So you kind of have to be right there at the right time to watch it. And within a matter of days, it's gone again because it's so quick. But that's our closest planet to the sun. And it looks kind of like this. I always think this looks like a picture of a golf ball that's been sliced up. And, you know, you just have that funny little inner core. Very pockmarked, but very spherical. Very, very hot on one side, and very, very cold on the other, because it's locked gravitationally to the sun. So the same spot's always facing, similar to our moon is always facing the same surface to the, to the Earth.